Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. It is Monday, June 1st. Can you believe that? It's already the month of June. We're halfway through the year. Uh, just so much has been going on for many of us. And uh, here we are now at the beginning of the summer. Uh, it seems like school being out and so forth and still delayed graduations uh, through the summer. And uh, just uh, at least things are starting to get back to normal a little bit. But Glad you're joining us this morning as we spend some time in the book of James. We're in James chapter 1, and then I'm going to pick up where we left off, verses 9 and 10, 11 and 12. So we were talking about trials, and so we're continuing that same thought because we're trying to wrap up the, the entire thought that James has here about these things. Uh, but now we're going to change our focus on the aspect of trials to the people involved in trials. So let me read the verses for us before we get into it. In verse 9, it says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exultation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So Friday, we were talking about the resources behind uh, trials. James says we're going to have trials. He talks about the resources then are available to us as we go through trials by the enabling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so... As he talks about these two topics, now, as I mentioned just a minute ago, we're now shifting to the people that are involved in trials. And James really kind of separates everything into two categories. And so he's not only trying to deal with this in a precise manner, but he wants to really break this down in a practical way for us. And this is one of the many reasons that I really enjoy the book of James. It's, it, there's just so much wisdom that's being shared here, and it's given in such a straightforward approach for us. So there's two kinds of people that James wants us to look at. There's the rich and the poor. Now, obviously, there are people in between. But uh, to keep it at a, at a basic level, you know, we're going to talk about those who feel like they're lacking and those who feel like they're pretty well off. So now each person needs to understand their position, not only with God, but where they are in life as they understand and as they go through trials. So... When they're being faced with trials, they need to make sure, no matter what their social status is, that they're relying, that they're not relying on their on themselves, but rather that they're relying on God. Not that they should be bemoaning the position that they're in, but to see that they, as James said in verse two, count it all joy when you go through uh, various trials. So this is what James is getting at here in these first four verses, and here is the exhortation here. In verse 9, he says, Let the lowly brother, the poor brother, let them boast in their exaltation. And let the rich man in his humiliation, meaning his position of humility. W what is James trying to say here? Well, what he's trying to tell us is that for those in the lowly position who don't have all the finer things in life, who don't see themselves in some kind of affluent position, who they should be the ones rejoicing and boasting in the fact that their position before God is not contingent on any of those things. Remember, in Christ, we are equal. Paul mentions that in Colossians we talked about. Even if they are in their socioeconomic status, that they would be either be considered poor by others or they think themselves to be poor, that's not the, that should not be the focus of their attention. Rather, the focus of their attention should be in the fact that they are a child of God. So they shouldn't be complaining about the circumstances of life, but rather rejoicing in their position with Christ. You know, it, it's easy for us to get depressed, for us to get jealous, for us to be even envious of people who have more than us. You know, when trials come, those feelings can even be magnified by the situation. And what James is trying to tell us is, don't let trials get you further into your self-loathing. Rejoice, friends. Rejoice, brothers, that your position with God because of Christ, that's what you need to rejoice in. Okay, sure, you don't have everything you want, 
Maybe you don't even have some of the things you need at the moment, but you really have so much more than you could ever deserve. Just give that some thought. We have more than we could ever deserve because of Christ. Rejoice in that fact. Rejoice in the fact that you're a child of God. There's no favoritism. There's no prominent position, especially based on circumstances or social status. Not with the Lord. Now contrast that in verse 9 with those that are wealthy. Now being well off honestly has its own temptations. It's easy for those that want for nothing, for people that are affluent, to easily depend on self. Because they can very easily say, okay, that's not a problem. I can just throw money at this situation and that'll take care of it, right? And people can actually be, uh, they can be captivated, they can be... Uh, enslaved by that aspect of thinking that they are able to handle all these problems on their own. Why? Because they're wealthy. They, you know, how, what do you mean money isn't the answer to all my problems? And so it's easy for those who want for nothing to be able to get things done in their lives. It's not much of a hindrance to them, which means in contrast that they're not fully relying on God. They're not trusting in God for his provision for their needs and desires. They trust in themselves. So wealth can be its own trial. Sometimes it's actually better off not to have those things and not to be better off because it can bring about its own temptations in our lives. And so what James is saying to those people is you don't need to rejoice in what you have, what you've earned, rather in what you could not earn. You could not earn your salvation. You are a child of God, not from anything that you've done at all, but purely by the grace of God in your life. And so, rich people are encouraged to rejoice in their humility in the fact that when trials come, that they can still look to God and say, you know, I, all the stuff that I have is only because of God. No glory to myself, all glory to the Lord. The Lord allows me to be in this position. Fully relying on God, not on your material possessions. Why? Because what does James say? Like a flower, it's all going to pass away one day. What God offers us is eternal. Even the wisdom that's offered from earlier in our study, as it applies to the various trials in our lives. What should happen here is that wealthy people should rejoice in the opportunity to be reminded that their real treasure, their eternal treasure the treasure that is worth pursuing after and accruing is not what's here on earth, but it's about treasure in heaven, as Christ even says in the Gospels. But then if you look at verse 11, it says, For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers like the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So out of verse 10, is he's talking about this flower of the grass that passed away, and then he adds to that illustration. He's continuing this fading away aspect. The rising of the sun that quickly comes up, it scorches grass, it makes flowers wither up. The beauty of those things perishes because it's so short-lived. We don't have to wonder what he's illustrating because he states it right away. It's not like we have to try to connect the dots here. He says, this is what the rich man's like. This is what's going to happen. The rich man that's going to pursue these things, that, that goes after these things and thinks they are the most important things in life, it's all going to fade away. Like James is going to say later on in the book, that, that our life is like a vapor. We see it and then it's gone. Acquiring wealth, prestige, you, you know, your name on a building or a street somewhere, those might be enjoyable. They might make you feel really good in the moment but they are not the kind of eternal rewards that we should be seeking. And I really believe what James is trying to get at here is that he's trying to help those who are in these positions. He's trying to encourage the people that don't feel like they're very well off and say, look, you have so much to rejoice about. And then to the ones that are better off, not that being rich is a sin in itself, it's what we do with these things. And he's trying to warn brothers and sisters that may be well off, the business people and otherwise, and say, listen, you've got your own unique challenges to face because you are better off. Those come with their own temptations. And if we don't pursue spiritual wisdom, then acquiring wealth is only going to make us feel empty. 
Those who are rich should look at trials, as I stated before, as an opportunity to grow, to learn, to lean into the Lord and mature as believers, just as those who are lacking should also lean in and draw an eye to God and want to pursue holiness. You cannot allow, we cannot allow, one's financial stability or lack thereof to create this false sense of security or create this self-loathing issue that prevents us from focusing on Christ. That's what James is getting at here. Listen, you're going to go through trials. He doesn't make any excuses for that. And if you're in one of these two positions, they each come with their own unique issues that you have to work through as you go through these trials. But I want you to notice the word of encouragement here. I mean, it's not just doom and gloom here, not just warnings and, hey, this is going to go really bad if you don't pay attention. But look at what verse 12 says as we wrap things up. It, it's almost like there's an, an addition to the Beatitudes that Christ has in uh, Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. So as he's wrapping this up in verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So for those who endure, for those who remain unwavering during trials, that person, James says, is blessed. This is not a wishful thinking kind of response. James says that we are blessed, that we're happy. Why? As we remain fixed on Christ during the trials in our lives, not only do we grow from them, not only can we gain wisdom as we walk through them, but there is a reward for us. James says we will receive a crown of life. Now let me point out to us that there are two types of crowns that are commonly talked about in Scripture. The crown that we would see related to, say, kings and rulers, that's called a diadem crown. It's the crown of authority and rulership. Now that crown of life that's being referred to here in James is not this, ste- uh, is not this uh, diadem kind of crown, but rather it's, co- it's a Stephanos type of crown. It's a Greek word meaning it's, it's a victor's crown. It's a reward kind of crown. Uh, much like Paul would have referred to in other places in the epistles. And as you might see in the early Olympics, they would receive these wreaths, these crowns. Uh, obviously, those relating very well to what James has said earlier did not last forever. They faded away, often made from some kind of uh, tree branch or whatever. And But those would be the symbols of completing a task, those symbols of winning a prize in a sporting event. And the reward for enduring trials is not, uh, we need to understand that this isn't God saying he's going to one-up us over other people or that he's going to put us in some kind of prominent position to where we're better than other brothers and sisters in Christ. No, it's that this reward that he offers us, it, it's not the symbol of, of better Christianity, as it were. Because then what would we do? We would just be boasting in ourselves. We'd be boasting in our own works, our own way of handling trials, like, ha-ha, look what I did. I'm better at this than you are. That's not it at all. Rather, it's an opportunity to give glory and praise to God for what he's done in our lives. God has promised this reward to who? To those who love him. And as we endure trials in this life, by the power of the Holy Spirit, for the glory of God, we show our love for the Lord. And we make much of him in this process. So the reward here is a, a crown of life. Not just not some physical reward that God gives us to show off to other people. And as we endure these things, think about the gospel opportunity that's presented in trials. That as we are able to glorify God, as we're able to make much of him, as we cope with things that, that the world looks at us and goes, How do they do that? How are they going through these things? And we can say, much like the song does, yet not I, but it's Christ in me. It's God working through me in these trials, and I'm growing closer to the Lord because of it. It's a great opportunity to be able to present the gospel to people. Say, look, this isn't in my own strength at all, but this is because of Christ. Let me tell you about him. That we are able to smile in the midst of sorrow, that we can have joy in dark times. That's confusing to the world around us. So we shouldn't be looking for some kind of physical reward, is what I'm saying. 
We should be looking for how we can obediently respond to God in trials and live a life that is fuller and richer in Christ, that is full of unending joy both now and in eternity. So my concluding thought for us this morning is this. May we, regardless of whether we're rich or poor or somewhere in between, May we see trials as an opportunity to glorify our Savior, our Redeemer, our King. May we use them as gospel witness opportunities. May we rejoice that we can grow and learn through them. Friends, let us rejoice in whose we are in Christ. For in Him we have our reward and we also have our hope. May these words encourage you as you go throughout your week this week. And I look forward to spending some time with you in the latter part of James 1 next time.